Hello again. Welcome back to Bioinformatics on a cold day in Morgantown. We actually got some snow uh, yesterday afternoon, so I thought it'd be a good time to revisit the ice planet Hoth. Uh, so today we're going to start talking about patterns and patterns in biology. Um, these slides are available on Google Drive. Let me just um, share my screen with you. Okay, so patterns in data. We're going to start by talking about the language of patterns, what we mean. Uh, so first I want to start with a shout out to a fairly old movie by now called Pi. This is not the movie called Life of Pi, very different. Um, but it's an intriguing, um, somewhat strange movie to watch if you're sitting around bored with uh, looking for something to do. Um, three things, three assumptions in this movie that this movie centered around. First, as you may have heard before, uh, many people consider mathematics the language of nature and everything around us can be represented and understood through numbers. This is also at the core of bioinformatics. And then if you look at these numbers, if you graph them, if you look for um, particular trends in these numbers, you will see patterns emerge. Um, patterns are everywhere in nature and science is in many ways the search for patterns amongst chaos. <clears throat> and so patterns um, play a extremely important role in biology as well. Why do we care about them? Um, here's our kind of biological bent on the mathematical approach uh, outlined in the previous slide. Uh, a pattern in biology generally implies conservation. It occurs in some form in multiple places. <clears throat> if it has been conserved, that implies that it is important in some way. <clears throat> it implies there's a, a driving reason to keep it around, essentially. If it is important, that implies that it, form, it serves some functional role. So patterns imply conservation, Conservation implies they're important, and they're important in general because they are functional in some way. Again, this is an oversimplification. There are certainly exceptions to this rule, but this is why we care about finding patterns in biology in particular. And I've kind of summed it up in this um, purple text at the bottom. Patterns in biology are the fingerprint of natural selection. Natural selection tends to guide us towards patterns. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with just some simple concepts of pattern searching. Here's a data set of nine uh, song titles, some really awesome, some I've never heard of before. These are not related in any way, so not related by ancestry. Um, they are not all sung by the same person, etc. But we can still search this simplistic data set for some patterns. Let's start with some really easy ones. For example, um, pattern number one, any instances of the word sorry? And we can highlight those in red. There are four. Another pattern we might search for are words that start with S-O-R, which include the four instances of sorry, but also sore. Another pattern are, might be words that start with S-O. We bring in a couple of additional words with this pattern, souvenirs and some. Finally, a fourth pattern might be four-letter words. So this is slightly different. Here we have 10 four-letter words. There is some overlap with pattern number three, words that start with S-O. For example, sore is a four-letter word that starts with S-O. Some is a four letter word that starts with SO. There's an intrinsic difference between the first three examples here and the fourth. And that difference is this. The first three examples are simply text searches. I give you a particular string, sorry, or SOR, or SO, and you search for it. Think Control F or Command F when you're searching in Microsoft Word or in a web browser. So those first three are instances of text searches where the pattern 
is the exact text. This fourth example is not a direct text search, but rather a pattern. And that pattern is four letters surrounded by whatever makes a word. You might say four letters surrounded by white space. They can be any letters. So in this particular case, this fourth pattern is a pattern that is different from the exact text that you're searching for. And then that last example that we put forward, four letter words that start with SO, the overlap case, that is also a pattern that you cannot assign a specific text word to like sorry. So what we need in order to search for these patterns is some language to describe them. So how do we talk about encoding patterns like this, patterns that don't exactly match a string of text like the word sorry? And the language that we use in bioinformatics and in computer science is based on something called regular expressions. That's just another way to say a pattern. A regular expression is a pattern. It's something that repeats regularly. You might also often see these um, abbreviated regex, R-E-G-E-X is just a, an abbreviation for regular expression. What does this do for us? Defining a language gives us a way to describe patterns to each other, but more importantly, describe patterns to a computer or a computer program. These patterns, these regular expressions, are extremely powerful tools for searching. You have them at your disposal right now. If you use BB Edit or Text Wrangler or the free version of BB Edit, it comes with regular expressions built in. I often use BB Edit as a way to play with pattern searching. But they're also in various terminal commands, and we're going to see those in just a minute. They're a fundamental component of modern computer software as well. And as XKCD points out quite correctly, once you learn how to use regular expressions, they will make you feel like a superhero. Just a shout out, we're going to cover the very basics of regular expressions. If you want to learn more, if you want to become a Jedi master of regular expressions, <clears throat> if you want to understand what a regular expression like this means and how to write them, <clears throat> there are many books out there. Here are just a, a few of those books you can go look at. So let's start with a few simple examples. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the most popular ones is an email address. How would we search for an email address? Another one more apropos to bioinformatics is searching a DNA sequence or an amino acid sequence. These are things we might want to search or we might want to start thinking about when we build a regular expression. For example, the top one. If we want to search for email addresses on a web page, if we want to scrape email addresses from a bunch of web pages, we need a pattern to do that. They don't all start with TPD0001, just mine does. So what do email addresses have in common? What is the pattern underlying an email address? It looks something like this. You have some username followed by the at symbol followed by the domain. Now what's in the yellow and blue boxes can be different strings and they will be different strings. For example, this is my work email. My Gmail address is driscollmml at gmail.com. So the one thing these have in common is that at symbol in between. A DNA sequence, we might be searching for something like coding regions or codons. We know these are strings of three letters, three adjacent letters. So here I've highlighted them with alternating blue and gold. So these are patterns that we might want to search or we might want to build a regular expression around searching for these patterns. In order to do that though, we need the building blocks of our language. We need to know how to encode these particular elements. How do I encode 
the concept of a bunch of characters, but I don't care how many. Or how do I encode a bunch of characters followed by a dot, followed by a com, if I'm searching for something like gmail or hotmail.com? How do I encode three, exactly three letters? To do that, we need a language. This slide shows some of the basics of our regular expression language. These regular expression um, alphabet, if you will, is pretty cross-platform. It works in BBEdit. It works in all of the command line tools that we have. So this is a good starting place for learning how to run simple searches. A couple of concepts to cover here. First, we have two things that are called anchors. For example, we might want to search for the occurrence of a methionine at the start of an amino acid sequence. Right, the start codon codes for a methionine. <clears throat> we don't want to search for just any methionine. We specifically want the one that starts the amino acid sequence. So we say we anchor our search to the start of a line. And we do that with this little hat symbol. <clears throat> we can also anchor a search to the end of a line. Let's say we want to find the last amino acid in every single um, sequence that we have. We can say, give me some character that is anchored to the end of the line. When you think about these, you can think about them as indeed anchors. It's stuck to the beginning or it's stuck to the end of the line. We can also search for different character classes. These are things that encompass larger groups of characters. For example, we want to search for um, a word, and words are often separated by white space, but it could be a space or it could be a tab. We're not quite sure or we don't want to distinguish between those two. And so we have this backslash S that encodes both a space and a tab. We can negate that and say, I want to search for anything that's not a white space character. So any letter, any number, any punctuation mark, anything that doesn't fall into that class of white space. We can search for digits. Here we don't discriminate which digits we want, just the fact that a digit appears this character class, this pattern, will find any digit. We can negate that as well, anything that's not a number, not a digit. There's a final one called the word character class. This um, is subtly different it's in its implementation in different systems, and so I generally don't use this. But it searches, this backslash w, will find any word and that's any string of characters separated by word boundaries, space, punctuation, etc. Okay, <clears throat> there are some characters that are used in regular expression language to mean something other than themselves. Okay. We've seen a bunch of these already. This hat symbol is an actual symbol you could search for. I want things that have that little hat symbol in them. And so our regular expression interpreter needs a way to know whether you mean search for the hat symbol or anchor my search, which uses the hat symbol. In order to make that distinction, we have to do something called escaping. We escape these what are called meta characters, these characters that take on a larger um, larger meaning or different meaning. So for example, the hat, if we want to search for the actual hat symbol, we need to escape it. And we often escape it using a backslash. So for example, this character class for white spaces, it's backslash s, which means I'm not searching for the character s, I'm searching for something that is a white space. So this backslash is often called the escape if we search for backslash hat, we mean no search for exactly the hat symbol. I'm not telling you to anchor my search now. 
telling you to use that symbol as itself. Same for the end of line or the dollar sign. If I want to search for the dollar sign symbol itself, and I don't want to be using that as an anchor, I need to backslash or escape it. So here's your list of meta characters that if you're searching for the actual character, you need to escape it. Otherwise, your regular expression program will think you mean something special or something meta. Okay, some more very powerful components of our alphabet. Quantifiers, these things tell us how many of a certain element we want to look for. So the star means search for zero or more. That means it can be there, but it doesn't have to be there. For example, if we're searching for a sentence, we may want to end the sentence with a period, but it may not end with a period. It may end with an exclamation point. So we want to capture it if it ends with a period, but we don't want to say it has to end with a period. We don't want to require the period. And that's what the star allows us to do. It says it can be there, but it doesn't have to be there. But it's okay if it is there. The plus symbol here is a quantifier that means at least one has to be there. Okay? I have to have a period. I can have a couple of periods in a row. That's fine, but I have to have at least one. Otherwise, you're not going to match that pattern. The question mark is a slightly different flavor of that. It says it can be there, or it doesn't have to be there. If it is there, there can only be one. So this, this question mark is a more strict, a more rigorous definition of the asterisk. So it can be there or not. The asterisk says it can be there <coughs> in many copies but it doesn't have to be, and the question mark says it can be there, but if it's there, I only let one in. And then you can be even more exact using um, these curly braces. You can say, I need exactly one period, or I need exactly three characters. You would just put a three in there. Or I need at least three, but I can also accept four, five, six, some other number greater than three. That's just the number followed by a comma and then at least x and at most y. Okay, we'll talk about lazy quantification a little bit later. Let's finish up with ranges and groups. A dot indicates any character. Notice this is a meta character. If you wanna search for a period or a dot, you have to escape it because dot is a very powerful group in regular expressions. And that group is anything. I want to search for a line that contains anything. For example, I want to search for a line that isn't just blank. I don't care what's on the line. It just can't be blank. Then you would use dot followed by a plus. So dot is any character, plus means one or more, which requires at least one character on a line. You can also search for either A or B. A or B can be anything. Let's say I wanna search for either T or V. I use the bar symbol in between, the OR symbol. You can search for a group using these parentheses. You can search for a combination or a combo using square brackets. I want to find something here that's either A or B or C. You can negate that combo. You can search for a range. This is a little bit more nebulous, but a range goes from a to Z, for example, or zero to nine. You can also negate that, anything that's not between A and Z. 
those are the basic elements of our regular expression language. They're a lot easier to understand as we start to put them into practice. So let's take a look again at our simple regular expression patterns. Here is our email address. Here's the user, the at, and the domain in blue. The simplest thing, we start with an anchor which means at the very start of this string, I want to have at least one of any character. So any character is the dot, and the plus is a quantifier on that. It says any character. How many? Well, at least one, but I can accept lots. Until I get to an at. So this question mark here when it follows the quantifier, go back to our alphabet, any of these quantifiers can be followed immediately by a question mark, even the question mark. So you can have two question marks in a row. Here we have a plus quantifier, which says one or more, and then the lazy quantifier, which says one or more character until I reach the first instance of whatever's next in my pattern. So whatever's next in my pattern is this at symbol. These parentheses are just grouping this first part together. Okay, so the regular expression pattern looks at the at symbol and it says find any character, one or more of them, and include in this match all of the characters until I reach the first at symbol and stop. That allows us to capture everything up to the first at symbol, which in this case is probably going to be the only at symbol if it's a formulated email address. So this is our username captured by this regular expression sub pattern. Then there has to be an at. Right, so the basic regular expression matches itself. So here's an at symbol, it matches itself. Kind of like the word sorry. The second part of our match is this sub pattern here. And again, this can be anything. Here's any character one or more times, all the way till the end of the string or the line. Okay, so this pattern is broken up into two sub-patterns separated by an invariant at. It has to be an at between these two. Now, if you're ahead of the game or if you've done regular expressions before, you'll notice that this is a somewhat simplistic approach to email addresses. There can't be white spaces in here, for example, whereas our pattern would pick up white spaces. So this would work in a very crude sense, but it can be um, it can be refined quite a bit. Okay, DNA sequence. How do I search for a DNA sequence, or how do I match a DNA sequence using a regular expression? Well, the inherent pattern in a DNA sequence, any DNA sequence, is a string of A's, C's, T's, and G's. We're ignoring some of the complexities about non-standard bases, et cetera. So for simplicity's sake, we're assuming DNA is made up of just those four characters. So if I were searching for a DNA sequence, let's say on a web page, I could start with something like this. This is a combo. I want to find an A or a C or a T or a G, and it doesn't matter what case it is. So capital A or cap C or cap T or cap G or lowercase a, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to find one or more of those. So anytime I find one or more of an A, C, T, or G, I'm going to call it a DNA sequence. If I were searching for just code, just three or more, let's say I wanted to make a minimum length of DNA, right, this would capture anything. For example, if a sentence started with the letter A, like a crazy dog jumped on me today, 
it would find that A and call it a DNA sequence. So instead, maybe I want a minimum number of these. And say, well, only call it a DNA sequence, only find this pattern if there are three or more instances in a row. So ACT. Now you might say three is not enough because if you have cat, that's a C followed by an A followed by a T, and that would match the pattern. So maybe I want 10, maybe I want 100. You can season that however you want. I'll leave amino acid sequence patterns to your imagination. There are lots of patterns we could search in here. We'll talk more about finding amino acid sequence patterns in the context of motifs and domains a little bit later. Okay, let's finish up with how you run grep in the command line. And then there's an activity up on eCampus for you to play around with this. Okay. Pattern matching in the command line, we usually use a program called grep. We are actually going to use a program called egrep. There is fundamentally very little difference. There's no difference in the way that you write the commands. And so I'll use them somewhat interchangeably. But grep and egrep are commands for searching any file using regular expressions. We use egrep because it allows us to use the full spread of these and more elements of our language. So egrep extends grep, and grep is a little bit too simplistic for us. So we're going to use egrep by default. It's set up like any command line. There's a command, egrep. There are some arguments if you want to use arguments. We'll talk about those in a second. Then, in these individual quotes, in these, within these single quotes, you put your pattern. The pattern is the regular expression. So if we go back a slide, this is a pattern. So to search for this, I would simply put this inside of my single quotes. So your pattern goes there. You don't need to escape the single quotes. Those are stripped by egrep before it searches for the pattern. And then you give it the name of the file that you want to search for that pattern in. Okay, so you have a command, some arguments that are optional, a pattern in single quotes, and then a file. Okay, a few of the option, optional arguments <clears throat> that you might want to use and that we'll play with in the activity. Uh, there are a lot more. In order to find them, you can use man grep. You can also use man egrep. It will bring you to the same manual page because they are essentially the same. Okay, if you use the dash C argument, you can count the number of matches. If you use the dash A, you can give it a number of lines and egrep will pull out not only the line that matches, but certain number of lines either after it or before it. And then, perhaps most usefully, you can write just the matches instead of the whole lines that contain the match using dash O. What do I mean by this? So what does grep do? What does egrep do when you find something? So when you search for a pattern, and here I'm just using the simple pattern called sorry. When you search for a pattern, egrep will give you any line in your file that contains a match to that pattern. So in this case, any line that contains the word sorry. You can change that so egrep writes just the matches themselves, which in this case would be just the words sorry, using the dash O. <clears throat> you can also change it so egrep just counts the number of matches that it finds in the file, using dash C. So in this case, it will print a number, and that will be the number of times it finds the word sorry. These are both clearly and subtly different. Clearly they're different because here you're just writing the word sorry a certain number of times, and here you're writing the number of times you find the word sorry. Whereas in A, the default behavior, you're writing 
the entire line that contains at least one sorry. Could be two sorries, could be 18 sorries. Grep will only print that line once. Okay, this gets easier as you play with it. So for activity 18, we're going to play around with it. There's a file on Google Drive called act18.txt. What I want you to do is download that file, put it on your desktop, then launch terminal, CD to your desktop, make sure that file is there. You should know how to do this by now. And then run these three egrep commands, A, B, and C from slide 19. Run those three egrep commands using act18.txt as your in file. Okay, so I give you the pattern. Again, this is not truly a pattern, it's just text that matches itself. So we're using this just as an example to get up and running with egrep itself. Then submit each command and its output as activity 18. You can copy and paste it from terminal or you can take a screenshot, whatever's easier for you. But somehow show me the command as you run it and what the output is from that command for all three of those, A, B, and C. Fairly straightforward. This will get a little more complicated as we start talking about true patterns and how they relate to biology in the next couple of slide decks. Okay, thank you, and um, we'll see you again in the next one.